Hello and welcome to my presentation on board games of medieval Europe. When we talk about medieval times, the Middle Ages, people usually have a vague idea about when this period ended, when uh, the Age of Discovery started. Uh, most people don't know so much about when it started, but let's just say the Roman Empire fell apart. Okay, so when we talk about board games, I, I'm only going to talk about um, actual board games as opposed to sports or uh, maybe hunting as other recreations, so we focus on board games only today. There once was a wise king and he asked the question whether our fate, uh, whether we make our own fate or all our life is predetermined by the hand of God. And he sent out his three advisors to find the answers. The first one returned and told him, when we think and plan ahead, then we can plot a path in our life that is unaltered by any random events, just like in chess. And the second one brought him the game of dice. And he said, no matter how witty you are, if God does not favor you, your opponent will always roll the better dice and you will always lose the game. So the third one said, I take the best of both worlds. When I, I have bad rolls in a game, I use my wits to balance that. So um, the image you see here is from a book called Libro de los Luegos. It was written or rather commissioned by Alphonse X, King of Castile, Leon, uh, Galicia, and so on and so on. I'm not sure if he's depicted here. And uh, yeah, at, at one point, he almost became King of Germany. But uh, as we all know, he didn't make it. Richard of Cornwall made the race. <laughs> but if he would have succeeded, he would have uh, been sitting in this. What's this? Huh. He would have been sitting in this um, throne. As avid watchers of the Game of Thrones series might know, a throne needs to be impressive. Sitting comfort is secondary. This is uh, the German king's throne. You can see it in Aachen. And it's made of stone slabs, but not any old stone slabs. Uh, when they built it in the ninth century, they just stole some stone slabs from the Temple of Jerusalem. Can't get any holier than that. And they just nailed them together. Every German king has been crowned uh, in this throne. And on the right side of the throne, you find this curious marking, which is actually uh, a board game. The game of Merrill's, Mills, or Morris. It has many names, and it has been popular even before medieval times, and it's still popular today. But it's in vertical position, so it's a bit hard to play. So how did the king play this game? Did he have sticky um, figurines or maybe magic powers or little slaves holding up the, the game pieces? None of that. The game board simply was etched in the floor plates of the Temple of Jerusalem. So people just played the game there, and it's still on the throne today. So the game is so simple, you can play it anywhere. You just draw your board wherever you are, in the mud or in a stone or whatever. You find some pebbles, some acorns, some shards, and you start playing. This is uh, what it looks in the Book of Alfonso. Um, this, uh, most of the games I'm going to present today are from the Book of Al Alfonso El Sabio. And uh, this here is the depiction of the Nine Man's Morris, or Merrill's, or Mills, or whatever you might call it. Uh, the game is simple. Uh, you take turns placing your pieces on the board, 
And when you're done placing them, you start moving them along the lines. Whenever you get three in a row, uh, you can remove one of your opponent's pieces until they have less than three, and um, then you win. Now there are uh, larger and smaller variants of this game. The smaller one you might know under the name of tic-tac-toe, or maybe, as the kids nowadays call it, match three. And um, the next game is also a very, very good game. You should try and play it. It's called Alkerk. Actually, Alfonso uh, named all the games that are played on lines Alkerk, but the name stuck with this one. Um, it's similar to the game of checkers, which was invented way later. I didn't find any uh, actual reference in medieval times to the game of checkers, which is played on a chessboard. And so this is the game of Alkerk. Uh, you move your, your pieces uh, one step at a time, or you jump over your opponent's pieces until uh, they have no, no, no pieces left. Uh, that's basically the rules. And um, if you, if you want to uh, force uh, a victory in this game, you have to add a rule that is actually not medieval. You can add something like uh, you can only move forward or um, maybe restrict uh, repetitions or something. But other than that, that's it. It's a simple game. A very good game. You should try. Next, this is a drawing from the runestone of Uckelbö. It depicts two people playing a board game, probably, and it's uh, a game of the Tafel family. It's probably a game called Nefatafel. It has um, these uh, markings in the corners and one in the center. And uh, the most popular variant of Nefatafel is called Tablut. Uh, Nefatafel was played on boards on all kinds of sizes all over Scandinavia. And uh, this one, Tablut, is played on the 9x9 nine nine board. There's uh, the white king in the center on the throne. And he tries to escape to one of the corners. And uh, his opponent tries to hinder him and capture the king. So it's an asymmetric game. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what's remarkable about the, the Tuffle games. And it works like this. All the pieces can uh, move just like the rook in chess um, in horizontal or vertical lines as long as there are no obstacles. Capturing goes like this. You enclose your opponent's pieces between two of your pieces, and then you can remove it from the board. If your opponent decides to move in between your pieces, nothing happens. Capturing the king uh, works by enclosing him from all four sides, or, as no one is allowed to step on the throne once the king has left it, you can also use the throne as the fourth piece to capture the king. So try the game of Nefatafel. Then there's a very s uh, similar game, uh, also from the Tafel families. It's called Halatafel. And uh, you might know it under the name of Fox and Geese. So, um, Similar to Alkerk, the fox tries uh, to capture all the geese by jumping over them, and the geese just try to capture the fox by enclosing him so he can't, um, he can't move anymore. Also an asymmetric game, Halatafel. Okay, now for something very different and uh, probably the most complicated game I'm going to present today. This is Rhythmomachia. So it's the war of numbers. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, let's first look at the setup. This game is based on math, uh, actually on, on arithmetic, on the proportions of numbers. So we divide the base numbers that are the numbers 2 through 9 in odd and even numbers. We don't use the one because that's very odd. So the, uh, what we see here is the base 
um, set up for the even numbers. Two, four, six, eight. And this is the first multiplex of numbers. A multiplex is when uh, in a number, um, a number is contained multiple times. So the first line is just the base numbers, and the second line behind them is just square. So they're contained in there twice. From this, we built the super particularis. <laughs> That's when the, the new number contains the base uh, number and part of that number. We do that two times, and then we build the super partions. That's when the new number contains the base number and multiple parts of that base number. And that's how we get to the, um, to the super particularis. And uh, there's one that's special, that's 91 in this case. That's actually also the sum of the squares one through six. So one squared plus two squared plus three squared and so on. And they're little pieces stacked on top of each other. They form a little pyramid. So this is the base setup uh, for um, even side, odd side the same. The board is eight by 16. This game was very popular. Um, some people say it was even more popular than chess. Not sure. Uh, it was invented uh, around 10.30 when the cathedral schools of Worms and uh, Würzburg actually wanted to decide uh, um, which school is better. So it was invented by a guy called Asilo, later improved by Hermannus Contractors and a little more improved in the 1070s uh, when they added color coding and so on. And uh, here's how it works. This is how the pieces move. So the, the multiplex pieces, they move just one. The super particularis, they move two, either in a straight line or at the right angle. And the super partions may move three, and uh, either a straight line or a right angle. How do you capture your opponent's pieces? There are several methods. The first one called eruptio. So you measure the distance from your playing piece to the one you want to attack. You multiply the number of tiles in between by your, your own number. And if that matches the, uh, the piece attacked, then uh, you capture it. Congresses, if two pieces happen to be the same number, and with a valid move, you would uh, land on the same spot this piece is captured. Insidia. If you place your pieces around your opponent's piece, so they sum up, in this case it's 36 plus 45 is 81, then you can capture your opponent's piece. And uh, the last one, if the, your opponent's piece can't move anymore because you surround it, you also capture it. So now, there is some debate on how capturing actually works. Because you can move to the spot you just captured, and removing the piece from the board might not be as useful. So I think they just turned them around upside down, um, and then they played for the other team. This is important, because we haven't talked about the goal of the game yet, winning. In this case, your, your goal is not to vanquish your opponent. No, no, no. You just go to your opponent's base, and there you build a, either an arithmetic or a harmonic progression of numbers. So in this case, arithmetic progression, the difference between these numbers is two. So um, five um, plus two is seven, seven plus two is nine. So this is the arithmetic progression. And the other one, the harmonic progression, uh, the difference between three and four is one, the difference between four and six is two, and so on. So you build harmony in your opponent's base. What a game. <laughs> And um, I built a replica. You can try and play it. 
Okay, finally, the probably most popular game of all times, chess. So this is actually not from the um, codex uh, from Alfonso. This is from the Carmina Burana. But uh, chess was just played all over the world. <laughs> and um, yeah, we're going to talk about medieval chess. It's a little different from uh, what we play nowadays. The setup looks very similar. Uh, if we look at the bottom line, there's the rook, a knight, the alfers, the firzan, the king, another, oh wait, no, I mix it up. It's a firzan, the alfers, the king, another a firzan, a knight, and a rook. And uh, in before them are the pawns. Eight by eight board. Okay, here's how they move. The rook and the knight move uh, just like today's chess pieces move. The rook as far as he can go, and the knight can uh, jump over pieces. Also the pawns, they move one step at a time forward, and they uh, capture diagonally. There's the firzan. He can move two, pieces, uh, two, two squares exactly, and he can jump, just like the knight. Um, then uh, the alphers. It's actually, um, it later became the queen, but at the time it was the alphers, which is kind of um, a counselor to the king or his, his uh, vizier. Um, so he could move only a little diagonally. Later that uh, piece became just more powerful. And uh, the alphers either stays with the king to defend him, or he can choose in the first move to jump over the pawns and lead them to battle. Um, and the king, this is uh, just a, a larger, larger version, and he, he moves just like today's uh, chess king. This is a um, depiction from Alfonso's book, and um, it's Alfonso's book contains a lot of board games, but half of the book is made up of chess puzzles called mansubs. And um, what we see here is probably the most popular mansub ever. Alfonso mentions it three times. And the story goes like this. There once was a rich sultan, and he had a beautiful wife called Dilaram. And the sultan played chess, and he gambled, and he actually gambled his wife. And mm, he was unlucky, or maybe just a bad chess player. The situation did not look very good for him. He's playing white. Let's look at the board. This was his position. So pretty much anything uh, his opponent does will end in a checkmate for white. But Dilaram was not only stunningly beautiful, but also very intelligent and probably a lot better chess player than him. And she cried out um, to him and uh, he, he, she cried, um, can, sacrifice, sacrifice your rooks and save your wife. And this is the active part of this talk. White moves. Any suggestions? <laughs> Did I lose you at Ritual Mo Machia? <laughs> slow, slow down, slow down. So, okay, we start with the rook. And uh, it's actually a rook sacrifice. King has to capture, because it's check. Now what? <laughs> okay. This is, this is a very difficult move. Remember the, the Firzan? 
He can, he can jump. Yes, he jumps over the knight, and it's this covered check from the rook. So the king has to move again. Uh, so, oh yeah, here, Frizan jumps, king has to move again. And next move. Oh, he was, he was in check from the rook. It was discover check. Uh, okay, next move. We're almost there. Yes! Sacrifice the second, uh, slow down, slow down. Sacrifice another rook. And king has to capture. Now what? We're almost there. <laughs> Simple kings in the corner. Yes, we move the pawn. Check. King has the move. He has only one square where he can go, where he can go because the other one uh, is covered by the Firzan. He has to move over there again. And final move, checkmate. Knight. Checkmate. That's it. The most famous Mansub ever. And that's how he saved Dilaram. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are many variants in uh, the book of Alfonso. This one is the uh, chess. Um, chess of season, uh, four seasons chess. Uh, the colors are spring, summer, fall, and winter, and it's a four player game. This is the great chess. There are so many pieces. There are camels, and crocodiles, and lions, and elephants. <laughs> also, notice the pawns are moved a little forward just to speed up the game because, I mean, it's a huge game. It's going to take a long time to play. They thought of many ways to speed up games, uh, also chess. And uh, at one point, they came up with the idea to use dice. So whatever dice you roll determines what pieces you move. And that's where we get to the second part of this talk, about making dice. So this is an illustration about how the dice making worked back then. Now, tell, let me tell, me tell you a little story. This is how I tried to create a replica of medieval dice. You have to go to a proper slaughterhouse and ask them for a bovine femur. That's the hind leg of a cow, and it's huge. It's, it's a huge bone. I mean, really, really huge. And if you ask them nicely, they chop it up for you in smaller, more manageable pieces. But it's still covered in, in sinews and, and stuff, so you have to cook it for hours, and your whole house smells like soup. But you end up with humongous pieces of clean white bone. You have, you have to saw them into smaller pieces, remove all the round parts and brittle, porous parts, because you only need the straight uh, bones. Bones are hollow, so you need the thick, um, thick walls of the bone. You saw them into bars, the bars into cubes, and you end up maybe with a handful of cubes. Then you forge a little trident drill and drill the r nice little holes in them with a, with a nice ring around. Add some charcoal to a lump of beeswax to make them nice and black. And then you have dice. In this image, the, uh, in the, the, the last part is where the vendor sells dice to a poor guy who has lost everything 
uh, gambling, but he still <laughs> gambles on. <laughs> okay, now we have dice. Let's play some games. The first one's called Riffa. Usually in medieval games, you throw two, mostly three, dice at once. Maybe it's because they're maybe a little uneven, so you even the odds. Anyway, you throw three dice, and uh, you keep throwing until you have two of a kind. Then you throw the third one, and you add all three numbers. Whoever has the higher number wins. The other one I'm going to tell you about is called Azar. You throw three dice. In the first roll, if you roll six or below, or 15 or above, you win. If you roll between seven and 14 points, that's your opponent's lucky number. Now you roll again. If you roll six or below, or 15 or above, it's called a Reazar, and you lose. If you roll between seven and 14, it's your own lucky number. And now you just keep rolling until either one's lucky number turns up again and this person wins. If you roll another Azar, it doesn't count. There are variants of the game, yes? Well, then you have to start over. Um, there are variants of the game, uh, like the, the raised Azar, when you, um, whenever you roll an Azar, you have to put more money, and that's actually the point. So if you play this game, it might be kind of boring, unless you play for money. <laughs> Finally, board games that involve dice. The most famous of them all, tablas, or tables, or trick track, or poof, or it has many names. You probably know the modern version, it's called backgammon. And um, Basically, what you do is you roll dice, two or three, there are countless variations in the book, and uh, thereby you place your pieces um, inside the board, you roll your dice and move your pieces around uh, to your home board, and uh, finally you move them out of the board again by rolling dice. And uh, as there are many variants, and uh, this one is called Poof. And that's the German word for whorehouse. And actually, <laughs> when you went to, to Poof, then you went to play the board game, the meaning has shifted slightly. Um, yeah, there are, there are many variations in the, in the book, uh, different, different kinds of, uh, of strategies. There's uh, one game, Fallas, where you uh, lose when you can't move anymore. There are variations where when you can't move your piece, um, your opponent gets your roll. This speeds up the game. There are variations where when you roll doubles, you, in, in the modern version, you, you can move them twice, but there you, uh, you use the top sides of the dice and the bottom sides, so that balances it a little bit. And um, there are even variations in board size. So there's, uh, usually you have uh, six places on each side of the board. Uh, but there are variations with seven or eight, so you have to have seven or eight-sided dice as well. There are four-player versions. This, again, is the version of the Four Seasons. It's a little bit like Pachisi, but it has nothing at all to do with that. 
Now, finally, do we have time? <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit. So I can talk about card games. This is um, a depiction from the Stuttgart card game. If you ever come to Stuttgart Landesmuseum, you should see these cards. They are beautiful. The picture can't do them justice. They're made with gold, and they depict um, dogs, ducks, does, and um, falcons, I think. Yeah. So a very, very beautiful card game. Um, this one is actually a late one. I think it's from 1503. And uh, the game you play with that is called Knuffel. And this is a curious one, because it was around even before the invention of the printing press. You can see that, um, how it came uh, in, in, um, into Germany or, or, or uh, from the southern parts of Europe. I think uh, it came uh, in 1370. It started with the church prohibitions in Basel. And the church quickly um, disallowed playing this game. Because uh, in this game, uh, the, the natural order of the world is turned upside down. The devil is higher than the pope. And the Landsknecht is the highest card you can get. No wonder the church didn't like it. On the other hand, that gave us some opportunity. There was um, this preacher. He was called Geiler from Kaiserberg. And um, he damned playing cards. He was very much against it. And by condemning this game, he pretty much explained all the rules. This is good. <laughs> so now we can, we can still play the game. Also, um, we, found, we found some cards. Um, the first ones printed with wooden blocks was around 1440. So it, um, there must have been something. I mean, when they, when they had, in the, in the late 14th century, when they had so many playing cards that the church had to, had to prohibit it. They had to have some means of duplicating cards, and I don't know exactly what it was. Um, but later, they used wooden blocks to print them and um, stencils to color them. And I think this one um, is um, a special, uh, it was a lucky find, because the City Chronicles of Basel, big book, was wrapped in paper. And this paper happened to be a failed print of playing cards. It was just a huge piece of paper, and they used it to wrap the City Chronicles. So someone unwrapped it, and they found the whole set. Perfect. <laughs> um, the game of Carnuffle is a trick-taking game. It's for four players. Uh, they're dealt five cards each, and they play together two and two. Uh, it's a very quick game. You can play it in between whatever else you're doing. Okay. The sources, the books I used, and uh, here's an overview of, uh, of all the games I've been talking about. I recreated all these games I've been talking about today. And I brought them, and you are welcome to try them. I am going to set it up somewhere downstairs, because I think someone else is going to use this room soon. But you can try all these games. And if you have any questions... <laughs> I know that was a lot. <laughs> There was a, a, a lot of games in a very short time. <laughs> um, the question was, why many of these games have Arabic names? 
And yeah, that's true. I, I mean, most of the games I presented today are I took from the book of Alfonso. And um, this, uh, the region, Catalan region, uh, it was a melting pot of cultures at the time. So there were Arabs and Jews and all, uh, all cultures mixed. And the Arabs indeed have a very big influence. So many, many games uh, actually come from the Arabic culture. And I think even chess came from Persia to Arabia and this way to, to Spain and then Europe and all the Al-Kurk games. So yeah, that, that I think that explains why they have Arabic names. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're from the Scandinavian region, yeah. They were also popular in, in England and Scotland. Uh, I think they even found a game board or a description of a game board that was 18 by 18. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, um, the question was if I have any printed rules for, for the games I brought. And I'm sorry, no. <laughs> but I will be available and I try to explain uh, the games. Most of them are pretty simple and maybe once I explained it to people, they can explain to other people coming later. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I didn't know about that rule, <laughs> but maybe yes. Okay, no more questions. I, I can tell you some, some more anecdotes, <laughs> but I think we're done for now. I'm going to set up some games downstairs. You're welcome to try them. Thank you.